Well, I'd like to thank the Rumi Forum. I'd like to thank all of you for uh, coming this evening uh, for what I'm hoping is a really uh, interesting discussion. And I'm going to try to make this as interactive as possible. And, uh, and so my name is Dr. Sanjeev Sriram. I'm a pediatrician here in Washington, D.C. I work for Children's National Medical Center, and I volunteer for the National Physicians Alliance. And I, uh, I've, I had my medical training done at UCLA, and I have uh, I've done work with health reform, and I uh, currently blog for the Huffington Post on issues of health policy and social justice. So it's a real thrill uh, to introduce a hero of social justice, uh, somebody who has done tremendous work for uh, keeping the poor on the agenda of discussions in Washington and across the country. Uh, who has spoken for uh, the American poor uh, in ways that bring them dignity, that bring them awareness, and I'm thrilled to, um, to have Dr. Edelman here with us. Um, for those of you who don't know, he's an associate dean with the Georgetown School of Law. He's uh, worked with uh, a, lot of, a lot of famous leaders, uh, including uh, Robert Kennedy, and he um, served in the Clinton administration and actually took a very difficult but principled stand uh, when President Clinton uh, signed um, the uh, welfare reform uh, law in 1996, it was uh, Dr. Edelman who took a reform, a very uh, principled stand to, um, to resign in protest. And um, we're going to hear about that and uh, a lot of uh, current um, issues that are going on with uh, the socioeconomics of the United States. So I don't want to take up too much more time. I'm going to hand the, hand the floor over. Well, thank you. Uh, what a pleasure to be here. It's a small group, so we can have a conversation. So I won't uh, talk very long, and, and uh, we can get into things that you all would like to get into. Um, the, uh, the, there's a kind of a, of a paradox uh, about, about poverty in our country. Uh, on the uh, on the one hand, we have 46 million people who are poor by the way we measure poverty, and, and uh, that's a huge number. Um, it's gone up just uh, since President Clinton left office by uh, almost 50 percent, by about 15 million people, about 6 million more. Before the recession started, about 9 million more in the recession. Uh, and so it, it you know, it tempts you uh, to say, uh, when you hear various politicians who say we, we fought a war against poverty and we lost, uh, it tempts you to say, hmm, maybe that's true. Uh, but it's not. Um, and and the, the book is really uh, about why, it's, why it is so hard to, why we haven't done better. But I always want to start by saying that we've done a lot that's right. Uh, you, you know, the 50th anniversary is coming of the War on Poverty uh, next year, so-called War on Poverty. Uh, and we're going to hear a lot more of that fought a war on poverty uh, and we lost. And, and it, it's just not true. Um, the policies that, that we have, and I'm just talking about uh, federal policy, national policy, there's so much more that goes into reducing uh, poverty. Uh, uh, I want to have us talk a little bit about the medical legal partnership at National mm -hmm. Children's Hospital Center uh, that you're very much involved uh, with, uh, Doctor, because this is something uh, that's happening. Uh, I mean, there may be indirectly some federal money with Medicaid reimbursement, but uh, this is something that somebody has to decide to do at the local level mm -hmm. or, or it doesn't happen. Um, but nationally, we're keeping 40 million people out of poverty. Uh, we would have 86 million instead of 46 million if we didn't have Social Security, that's the biggest thing, but also the Earned Income Tax Credit and the Child Tax Credit and food stamps or SNAP as we now call it. Uh, and uh, various housing policies, long, long list uh, of things. Uh, and so uh, these, are, these are policy successes. Um, food stamps, we, we discovered in 1967, uh, 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 I went with Robert Kennedy down to 
Mississippi and, and we saw children and that's a story that we can go into if anyone wants to why that was and it had to do with the economics and politics that was going on in Mississippi and other parts of the south at the time but uh, children uh, in in this wealthy country who had swollen bellies who had sores on their on their arms and legs that wouldn't heal uh, and from that we we came to have a national food stamp program 47 million people now are being helped and you don't see that kind of extreme malnutrition you, you see poverty you don't see that kind of extreme malnutrition that that's a that's a policy success Medicaid has made a huge difference mm -hmm. uh, in, in uh, infant mortality uh, uh, compared to where we were uh, as much as we worry about, about uh, health coverage and of course we are getting uh, what we hope will be 30 plus million people added uh, health coverage including 16 million Medicaid if, if all the governors decide to go in. Mm -hmm. uh, but Medicaid is a big success and what we've done with housing, we still have an affordable housing crisis in the country uh, and you see families at, the, at your work at the hospital who are living in horrible housing, but compared to what it was 40 and 50 years ago, it's changed tremendously. Mm -hmm. So we've had these, these successes. Well, still, 46 million people who are in poverty, what's that all about? Um, if you go back to, to uh, 1968 uh, and, and uh, think about, uh, for, for most of you that means you don't, weren't there, mm -hmm. um, but think about where we were. We had cut poverty in half in this country. We'd started measuring poverty in 1959. We invented the poverty line in 1962 and then ran it backwards for a couple of years. Anyway, 59 is the first year, 22% of our people uh, by 1973, 11%, cut it in half. So there was a sense of movement. The result of the Civil Rights Movement uh, was that there was significant reduction because of people getting jobs as a result of, of anti-discrimination laws, uh, mayors because there was the, all the urban unrest, hiring lots more African-American people and, and so black poverty went down from the mid-50s to the mid-30s, still way too high, but a but very, very big drop. So um, I think I thought then that we were ahead in the right direction and, and we would move ahead. So what happened? Well, there's a lot of things um, that we didn't expect. Uh, the economy changed. I mean, we all know this. Uh, we, uh, in the manufacturing jobs that, that had been the way in which the middle class got built in our country, and uh, including the black middle class, disappeared uh, to other countries, to, to uh, technology. Uh, and we turned into, really, we've turned into a low-wage nation. And I don't think we focus on that enough. The, the, the biggest single problem, there certainly are, are problems of, of concentrated poverty, which are terrible, which is another of the things that we didn't uh, expect would continue in the way that it did. It was certainly there, but it got worse uh, and, not, uh, and not better. Uh, and there are problems of, uh, well, really, you know, family issues. A lot of different things go into making poverty. Uh, but uh, if you had to name one thing, it's low-wage work. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, at the very bottom, it's also the holes in the safety net. But you have uh, within within what we call poverty, which is is uh, for a family of three is about nineteen thousand dollars a year. Family of four is about twenty three thousand dollars a year. Um, almost sixty percent of families that are work that are living in poverty, somebody's working, somebody's bringing in some money from uh, from work. Uh, and and uh, so this idea that th this is some group of people who are just other, you know, who are some different kind of a person, it's just 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 not not true. So uh, you have now 106 million people, a third of the people in this country, have incomes below twice the poverty line. 
below $38,000 for a, a family of three. That's a very large number. And that's the low wage work. Uh, second thing that we didn't expect was the changes in family structure in the country. Now this is a, this is a tremendously complicated, uh, controversial set of issues uh, and, and uh, uh, a lot to be said, although we should understand that the number of uh, children living uh, in, in uh, households where the parents are not married, uh, where either mom had a child not being uh, married or whatever it happened, this, this is true uh, across uh, the industrial and post-industrial world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's true uh, significantly across racial lines in our country, uh, even though it, we very much think of it uh, as an African-American problem uh, and the numbers are highest in the African-American community. But in fact, the numbers in the African-American community, the rate per thousand, uh, has it, been steady for uh, 30 years. Uh, in, in fact, it's gone down some, and the increases have been in white families and, and uh, in Hispanic families. <coughs> anyway, so that's the second thing. Well, when you, when you uh, combine the low wages, um, and half the jobs in the country pay less than $34,000, that's what I mean by low wages, and a quarter of them pay less than the poverty line for a family of four, 23000 who uh, is, is the, what are the families where there's only the possibility of getting one job? Single mom. Uh, where they could, where you had a two-parent family, they could send mom on out to work? Not so bad. Um, so that combination, I mean this, the, the question of low-wage work is particularly a, a question of, of uh, moms and kids. It's, it's a women's issue, it's a, a children's issue. And uh, we're just sort of not focusing on that. And those, the people in those low wage jobs have been stuck. Uh, well, we've had at the, at the top, uh, we all know that the, the top 1% has just gone up and up and up. Uh, the, did you see uh, in the paper recently that between 2007, 2009 and 2011, the top 1% uh, actually went up by 11% in their income. And uh, the bottom 99%, and I don't think it's the same at 99 as it is at mm -hmm. 1, but the bottom 99% went down, 0.4%. Mm -hmm. So at the bottom, uh, all the people in those jobs b below $34,000, they've gained 7% in, in uh, 40 years, 7%, so less than a fifth of a percent a year. So that's the low wage work piece and it's very much an issue about women and children and it's why children have become the poorest age group. And of course the elderly, great policy success with Social Security and so they're the least poor a group now. Well, we didn't expect, as I said, the, the concentrated poverty, we didn't expect what's happened to our public schools um, which of course interacts with the fact that you you can't succeed uh, as you could before being a high school dropout and getting a job in the steel mill that that doesn't work anymore um, so it's very uh, it's very de destructive not to have n not only a high school degree but post secondary of mm -hmm. some kind for the jobs of of the 21st century. Uh, uh, the immigration, uh, in terms particularly of, of undocumented people, has, has an effect at the low wage uh, end of, of the job market. Um, we did a, it, if a lot of what I'm saying is about what's happened to the economy and the interaction of the economy with family structure, um, we did ourselves a self-inflicted, if you want to put it that way, thing at the very bottom with the 1996 welfare bill that you mentioned, doctor. Uh, because it's turned out that even though uh, elected officials, politicians are still talking about all these people who are on welfare, it's practically non-existent. Uh, so you had 68% of families, uh, poor children living in, in families, had uh, cash, cash assistance, the old welfare. 
aid to families with dependent children before, 1990, uh, before 1996. Uh, that's now down to 27 percent because uh, what happened was they took away the, the old welfare system stunk. Uh, it, it didn't help people. There were 14 million people on welfare when President Clinton took office. That was too many. We weren't helping people get jobs even when jobs were available. People were kind of allowed to sit there. But what they did instead was to uh, essentially uh, demand that people go to work without much help for them, although it varied state by state, and no legal right. So you have a legal right to food stamps. Food stamps went from 26 million people uh, before the recession to 47 million now. You have a legal right to food stamps. Um, the uh, welfare was down to 3.9 uh, million before the recession, went up to 500,000 people, went up to 4.4 million people uh, in the recession. Half a million people in, in, with the worst recession since the Great Depression, half a million people. So you have uh, half the states, fewer than 20 percent of, of the children living in poor families are getting cash assistance. You have six million people now who, whose only income is from food stamps. Uh, well, no wonder you have uh, uh, so many, the deep poverty that we have. And again, that's uh, disproportionately a question of women and children. So these, these uh, pieces, we don't uh, kind of put them all out there and look at them and, and, and talk about them. Uh, race and gender still very much a part of this. You cannot really talk about properly about poverty uh, if you don't talk about the, the, the race as a factor in it. And of course I've talked about women and that's largely a, a question of women of color. Um, and uh, particularly in the last, uh, since the recession, the politics has gotten worse. I, mm -hmm. I, I've been surprised about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it's because uh, everybody's hurting and in the new poor, my perception anyway, the new poor, instead of saying, oh, uh, now I understand why it's important that we have all these helps, they say, who are these people that were already poor? Don't help them. Mm -hmm. um, and anyway, that seems to be the way the politics works. Uh, and so um, the, the kind of attacks on poor people that we saw in the 90s that led to the so-called welfare reform stopped for quite a while, if you think about it. We didn't hear much from uh, of a negative, at least out on the front burner, out in the public square from 96 until recently. But then uh, you had, uh, Governor Romney had a, uh, uh, an anti-welfare ad that polled very well in, in the recent campaign, and of course there's his infamous, infamous r remark about the 47 percent who were the takers, which of course went too far and hurt him. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of this is, uh, we did not, and, and including the, the tremendous growth and inequality that I uh, already mentioned, I think almost all of this we didn't foresee. Uh, and and what you have to add all of that together to, to understand why it's so hard to end, end poverty. Mm -hmm. Now there's a lot to be said about what we, what we should do. Uh, the first thing, of course, uh, I will say, and I have no uh, great magic formula, but we need a different politics. We need a little a different politics for a lot of reasons, uh, but that's one of them. I mean, it looks like the gun uh, proposed uh, mm -hmm. tougher gun legislation is going down the vote in the Senate today, uh, and you know here is this terrible tragedy, and still we don't we don't have mm -hmm. a, a, a politics, and uh, so that's fundamentally uh, what needs to be there and, and of course that's a question of a lot of things coming together uh, it's tough to do uh, we do have changing demographics that are important in the, in the country uh, about that uh, but also as I said before talking about the medical legal partnership and in, in, in your work uh, this is not just about public policy it's about what people do and do in communities and I find, as I go around talking about the book around the country, if I'm in Des Moines, Iowa, um, or Jefferson City, Missouri, 
uh, or Peoria, Illinois, all places I've been in the last two months. I found out how I play in, Peor in Peoria. I think it was all right, uh, unless they were lying. But anyway, um, the, the, uh, they all understand about the need for national policy. They understand about the need for uh, uh, public policy generally, uh, role of government. But they don't really get engaged in what I'm talking about and still, uh, until I start talking about uh, reforming the school system, uh, building a system of, of zero to five, of, of child development, uh, of, uh, of a way to, a way to help uh, young people get from here to there in terms of getting out of high school, getting into the the job market, uh, having uh, education that's relevant to their getting into the job job market of the 21st century. That's when people engage much more. Mm -hmm. um, so that it, it's it's totally. I mean, it's nothing surprising, but it it just happens over and over again. That that will sit there politely, and, but then I'll start, and, you know, and actually uh, get applause lines. We've got to do zero to five. Yay! <laughs> So it's kind of that's kind of nice. Anyway, maybe that helps uh, get us started. Uh, I, I, the, the main point is really uh, what the issues are are kind of not what people think about, or at least not add up uh, in terms of all of the facts and factors uh, in it. So. Well, I think one of the really fascinating points that you've touched on is this oxymoron of working poor. Mm -hmm. That I mean, this seems to be an unfortunately uniquely American concept that you can be working full time and still be poor in this country, which I mean, and I think that that's something that a lot of Americans, as you're describing, mm -hmm. now that they are newly poor, are you know starting to maybe appreciate, but are not necessarily aligning themselves with the with the plight of others mm -hmm. um, how is that I mean I think like when I'm in my work what I feel like I run into is a failure to like for many of my colleagues and many of people in my peer group to understand that oxymoron and uh, to really break past this concept of deserving and undeserving and I was wondering if you had any thoughts and insights on that as far as like how to kind of like you know, break through that loggerhead to to actually get the discussion moving in a positive direction. Well, I do. Th I, w I will say just parenthetically, uh, low wage work is becoming a problem uh, across the, the sort of post industrial world. I, w I was in Amsterdam um, mm. in in last September uh, at a conference talking about the book and. They're, they're, it's not as pronounced, but it's very definitely happening. Happening. They're, they're having. I mean, their infrastructure is so much newer because of World War II and so on. But that, that's aging as well, and they're seeing changes in terms of the location of jobs and, and so some of the same kind of things. But in terms of, of the, uh, I think one of the, what when I was a kid was a sixty-four dollar question. I don't know how many trillion it is. <laughs> kind of a question now. Uh, is how to reach people between the 100 percent and the 200 percent mm -hmm. uh, who are not technically poor uh, but they sure are having a tough time um, and you know it's complicated because uh, there it, there's a did any of you see American Winter it's a film that was on HBO uh, recently uh, the the filmmakers the same guys that made uh, uh, what's it called taxi uh, con taxi confessions um, anyway uh, they they stayed with eight families uh, who had lost jobs uh, and you could see I mean they're very reluctant to go get food stamps understandably I, I, you know I, it's completely understandable so um, there's a there's a pride factor in it um, in people you know we're an optimistic people mm -hmm. so um, you, you kind of have to convince it's a little bit of a burden of proof that you kind of have to convince people that that uh, these these kinds of supports and, and especially of course the first thing you want to do is raise wages mm -hmm. um, and so the money's coming from an employer and in how do you do that well we can raise the minimum wage but beyond that uh, I 
I'm a very strong union person and I would want to see uh, a, a revival of unions in the private sector. Haven't got, a, haven't got a recipe for that. So there's all of that. And I, I, I think we, we don't have a kind of a discourse about uh, the fact of, you know what, this is not about your particular, you didn't fail in some way. Right. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not something that's wrong with you. You're part of a structural, different words, human stories, so I'm just uh, talking here, mm -hmm. but you're part of a structural uh, situation in our country that's producing all of this low-wage work. Right. Now, you know, you start looking at, uh, I, if you have, I said different politics, um, you start looking at a different composition of, of the, the Congress over a period of time, what is it with these CEOs that, that are, uh, has, who's, who's uh, just, you know, within our lifetime uh, have gone up by many, many, many multiples? You know, the, the, that's not the answer, but, but you, uh, Walmart, could, Walmart is, is the largest minimum wage employer in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't tell me that Walmart can't afford to pay its workers more. Just, I mean, I, I don't accept that. Mm -hmm. So I think that they're uh, within a, a different framework of, of governance and public attitudes, you could talk about raising incomes. And then when you do things uh, like, uh, like the Affordable Care Act, you're effectively raising incomes. If we actually invested more in child care for people who need it and more in uh, affordable housing for people who need help, you know, only one person out of four who qualifies for a housing voucher or public housing gets it because we don't have enough money in it. So, you know, the, these uh, people uh, on, on the uh, I don't know what to call them because they're not really conservatives. But anyway, on the conservative side, uh, who say, well, if you add up all these things, everybody got all these, and well, nobody gets all these things. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we did, uh, and investing enough in helping people go to college, all of those things, that, that all adds to income. Right. And then the hardest part, uh, I think, in terms of, of uh, a, a con national conversation we ought to be having, is we already do have wage supplements. That's what the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit are. And so if you have a minimum wage job that pays $15,000 and you, whether you're a one fa parent family or two, but one minimum wage job, two kids, $7,000 added to your income. Now, that's you know not a big huge deal, but it's helpful. Mm -hmm. So all of that goes into it. Right, right. I think that, I mean, one of the other things that you were describing at the very beginning was uh, about, you know, the metrics. I think mm -hmm. we've talked about the optics of, of poverty and how we mm -hmm. have to have, like, kind of a new dialogue mm -hmm. about that. But when it comes to the metrics, you know, I think a lot of folks hear the absolute numbers mm -hmm. of earning $38,000 mm -hmm. a year. and. You know, they kind of wonder, well, doesn't that sound like some money? Doesn't right, that I sound, know. you know, like that doesn't sound sure. like the abject poverty that you were describing my, before? My, fr my friend uh, Steve Pollock, who's 80 some years old, started at the law firm of Covington and Burling in, mm -hmm. in 1959 for $3,000. Mm -hmm. Anyway. But I mean, but I think that, that, you know, but that's, but when people hear some of these numbers yeah. that where, you know, it's $38,000 right. and this person is considered part of the working poor, I feel like the, it's, it, it is kind of that convergence of metrics right. and optics. But I'm kind of wondering, do we have adequate metrics for measuring poverty? Uh, yes, uh, and if anything, they're too low mm -hmm. because you have to look at, the, at what it costs to live. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at rents. Uh, I mean, there certainly are parts of the, of the country where not so many people want to live there, which is why rents are really low. Um, but uh, the, the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, you know, has a concept of fair market rent, uh, which is 40% uh, of the median, I guess, something like that. Uh, anyway, um, there isn't a, a state in this country 
where a person with a minimum wage job can afford the fair market rent for a two-bedroom apartment, not in one, one state in this entire country. So th that's a metric, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's a complicated one, but right. uh, the, the, the point being, you know, people say, uh, I, I spoke the other day, we have a, a women's fellowship program at, at our law school and, and they're uh, American young women and African young women. Um, and uh, the African young women were saying, gee, that's an awfully high number. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about a dollar a day mm -hmm. per person or two dollars a day per person. Uh, so you have to look at uh, both sides of the equation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and then the, the other thing that I think uh, is sort of complicated to talk about, but really uh, in a country this rich, uh, the, the poverty line in European countries is a percentage of the median income. So it goes up as the standard of living goes up. We don't do that. And you know, you'd have an argument about that. Somebody would say, why are you allowed to do that? But uh, people should share uh, in the, in the, uh, you know, the richness of this country. So um, all of that would go into the conversation, but you're, com you're exactly right. I, I have a problem, as I say, with my Steve, Steve story of the $3,000, you know. I remember when I got out of law school and I clerked for a judge and made $6,000. So 38000 sounds like a lot to me. Right. <laughs> you have to think about it right. a little more. <laughs> well, I don't want to monopolize yeah. the question, so I, I well, mean. Let's sure. First of all, thank you, uh, Professor, for uh, uh, enlightening us mm -hmm. with uh, both the optics and the reality mm -hmm. of the book. Um, I look forward to reading your book uh, because I'm sure there's a lot more in it. But there's a couple of things which occurred to me, and perhaps mm -hmm. embedded in my comments are a number of questions. Um, you started off by almost an optimistic uh, mm -hmm. approach by saying that a lot has been done, and we've mm -hmm. to keep, I think the figure was 40 million out of poverty. Yes. And um, so the first question which comes to my mind is any way of scaling up those efforts which manage to keep the 40 million out of poverty so that we can actually reverse the trends mm -hmm. that seem to be confronting us. Uh, that's the first part. The second part, uh, Professor, is uh, you pointed out very rightly the complexity of the whole poverty issue in this country and mm -hmm. how it can be tackled. And you used a good phrase, if I can remember it, we don't put all the pieces on the table, it's difficult mm -hmm. to do that. But there is a level at which all the pieces do come on the table or should come on the table, and that's that with the legislators, with Congress and others, which should be looking at the, the future of the economy of this country and the, and the, and the social equitability uh, through the nation. Um, is that not being done, or is the bipartisan politics uh, so bad that that will never be addressed, or can you see some breakthrough there? So these two, two parts. Yeah, well, they, they're very much related to each other. Uh, the uh, the answer is not now. You, you, you know, we, we uh, elected, uh, re-elected uh, President Obama, which uh, I think is a, 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 of historic significance. Uh, I think a lot of people thought that wouldn't happen. Uh, and uh, so I, I personally celeb celebrate that. Uh, and uh, he comes back and it's the same old, same old. Uh, you know, it's like, no fair, mm -hmm. uh, we won the election. <laughs> uh, and the, the deal is uh, no, because we still c control the House, we control the, the uh, congressional politics. Uh, and so uh, you have to agree to all of these budget cuts that we want, which the President won't agree to. I mean, he's, it's controversial that he made that proposal about Social Security the other day. Uh, because otherwise uh, we'll essentially run the country into the ground, you know. We'll, we'll, we'll cause the, the uh, government to have to slow down and uh, close down and, and uh, etc. as far as the debt ceiling and all, all of that. So uh, I just don't believe that, that we're going to be stuck like this for, for uh, that much longer. It's going to be a while. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a while because the the, uh, I'm sure you know uh, that the Republicans did 
the Democrats made a bad political mistake in terms of their handling of the 2010 election. Uh, and uh, it's obviously what we call Monday morning quarterbacking. But, but uh, then in the states where they got uh, control of both houses of the state legislature and a, and a Republican governor, they drew both the state legislative lines and the lines of the congressional districts in that state in ways that essentially assure them of continuing to hold on uh, to those, all of those bodies, those legislative bodies. So as you know, nationally the Democrats got more votes for the House of Representatives than the Republicans in 2012. And uh, nonetheless, the Republicans still control it. So, so we, we, we do have to take the long view. Uh, and I do have an optimism about the long view, uh, in part because the demographics are changing in the country, um, and uh, there has to that you don't. It's not automatic what happens politically. People have to work to, to make something happen. Um, but um, I am optimistic about that. So, so. Uh, we've done all these things and I think we will do more and and we shouldn't forget the Affordable Care Act is a, is a huge achievement um, and, and uh, also President Obama in the Recovery Act in 2009 uh, that kept about five million more, that's about five million of the 40 million uh, were the policies in that law uh, there is policy about education, which we could talk about the details, but it's about education for low-income children, race to the top and all of that. So I can't sit here and say, oh, if we turn this switch over the course of the, this second term of President Obama, we're going to get <coughs> different, different results. We're not. But uh, over the course of the next uh, this is going to be a tough period for quite a while. It's going to take a long time to get out of this recession. I mean, it's very clear that, that it's not coming back quickly. Uh, all of the, the, I'll call them the thoughtful economists, uh, say that that's the nature of having been that far down. So that's a part of the, the short run uh, trouble. I think a really interesting and thoughtful presentation. My name is Abraham Abigail, retired from the Carnac Service. Uh, my question relates, number one, because uh, to the concept of poverty, because poverty is not a U.S. phenomenon, it's a global uh, concept in nature. Um, and could you please comment on how does the U.S. poverty situation compare to poverty in other parts of the world? Uh, this. The Rumi Forum is usually dealing with international issues. Yes. So I'm kind of uh, concerned about a comparison to Europe and maybe uh, Africa, Middle East, Asia, South America, and so on, in, in a relative sense. Uh, now, as it relates to, uh, as related to domestic poverty that was discussed here, uh, there was a constant mention of, of people with low low wages. What about people that are unemployed and do not have any wages at, at all? How do they manage? How long can they survive on uh, government uh, uh, subsidies or uh, payments? Um, um, you know, their situation appears to be more dire and desperate. And the media reports that many of them are unable to, uh, to to find jobs after a prolonged period of, uh, of lo and after losing their jobs. And also, uh, also, my last point is about middle-income uh, people that are raising uh, families, traditional family of two, of two, of two parents, two children, a nucleus family. My understanding is that it takes now about a million dollars to raise a child from cradle to through college. So how do they manage, where do they find two million dollars to raise a, a traditional family, uh, you know, and not, and not becoming poor? Yeah. So that's three great questions. <laughs> uh, well, let me, uh, let me try to tackle them. Uh, 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 of course, we have to think in, in a global sense, and, and uh, the poverty in many parts of the world that, that's uh, worse than, 
than uh, American poverty. People who are literally starving in some places uh, or who go through long periods where uh, there's drought and the politics that goes with all that. I mean, uh, you know all that. Uh, we have gotten to the point where uh, there are, uh, Catherine Eden from Harvard did some work recently. We have uh, something on the order of four million people who have family incomes of two dollars, less than two dollars a person per day. In other words, that is third world level. Uh, so that's kind of astonishing. Um, the uh, question of people who have very low incomes uh, and, and who have no work, you have, you have to separate out two things. One is uh, the situation in what, what amounts to a continuing recession for, for people, no matter what the economists say. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the obvious thing to say is uh, if, if you're just taking politics out of, out of the equation, that if there aren't enough jobs, um, there are two things to do. Uh, one is uh, putting aside how you would finance it, and you do have to finance it, right? So you're talking about some, some difference in the revenue stream coming in, but you invest in jobs. Uh, you invest in a New Deal style uh, Works Progress Administration, WPA, that we, as we called it then. Um, and uh, if you look at national needs, whether it's infrastructure that everybody talks about or having enough people uh, in that zero to five space that I talked about to work with children, uh, or building more housing that we need, all of those things, those are jobs. And you, you can have a public policy where you particularly uh, recruit people who are at the lower end, that means it's gotta be some skill development and, and so on. Uh, and the other part, for, uh, for those who aren't gonna get jobs in that way, um, you have to continue to provide unemployment. Um, so that's, but then you have, let's say you get back to the point of, of full employment. It's still going to be full employment uh, at, with a lot of low wage work. And secondly, there still are going to be the people who were, you were really asking about, which is uh, uh, where we were when we passed that welfare law in 1996. Uh, it's, it's having a serious strategy, and this is all sort of politics aside, right? But a serious strategy to, to help people um, get into the labor force. You want the maximum number of people working. You, need, you want the minimum number of people who are uh, receiving cash assistance as their, as their way of life. Uh, basically, you want only people who are disabled as far as people of working age. You want people who are disabled being the only ones who, who get uh, cash help. And for the rest, you do have some sort of a cash assistance system or a family allowance system or something like that. Um, so uh, that's a kind of uh, quick version of an answer to the second part of your or second question. Uh, the third part, yes, I mean, there is a squeeze. Uh, when I talk about uh, on up to twice the poverty line, Clearly, uh, in the whole, if, if, if you just look at the, at the pattern of income growth, uh, even on up above, just solidly in, in middle income people, I mean, it's no accident that all the politicians talk about middle income, right? There's a problem out there. Uh, it's just that some of us would like to, the president now talks about uh, middle class and people who aspire to be in the middle class. Uh, well, it's a little better. Um, and and the, the, the real answer is, uh, come on, this is a really rich country. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, one way or another, uh, we ought to be able to arrange our economy in a way that people are not squeezed like that. Now, it's also true that, that if you make uh, 
hundred thousand dollars a year well let's say seventy five thousand dollars a year over the 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 course of uh, well the, the course of raising uh, kids for 20 years that's a million and a half dollars so it's not so shocking that it adds up to to a lot of money um, it but the, the more you push that level of income down to what people are dealing with and you look at now the cost of, of college doesn't doesn't fit together any other uh, questions from the audience well, Again, I, I didn't want to monopolize the, the People have been very patient. Can I have another vote? Oh, yes, please. Uh, you know, I was reading the, the blurb which came with your uh, announcement mm -hmm. of your uh, speech. And uh, in that, uh, it's interesting, you looked at the, the salaries or the remuneration of the CEOs mm -hmm. of the uh, top 500 companies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you compare it with the, with the median uh, of, for example, the, uh, uh, I think it's the African American community. And there was a big, big uh, yeah. discrepancy, uh, 11 million, yeah. 38,000. Um, another very interesting comparison would be, and I think you hinted upon mm -hmm. this when you talked about Walmart, is that within the, uh, the, the 500 companies, what is, over the years, what has been the change in the structure of what management and the rest of the employees actually got, which would be a telling. Uh, yes, yeah, it would be. Yeah. Um, it's a very difficult figure to get, uh, I'm sure. But have you got any handle on this? Uh, B below the CEO level? Yeah, below the CEO. Level. I, I don't personally know. I think there's some numbers, but but and, and I think they would be comparable to what. N not so much that the 11 million, but but the gap. Uh -huh. So the trend would be. I mean. Yeah, the the trend would be uh, trend would be that. Um, the the if if you l look at what the labor department says are the top twenty growth areas for jobs, it's not not the sort of high management people you're talking about, but the larger numbers of people, uh, it's it's kind of a bad picture uh, because there's good jobs coming in the healthcare area mm -hmm. and and also some lower paying jobs, but. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's so many of these jobs, like home health. The the average pay for a home health aid is twenty three thousand dollars. In other words, uh, half the if I don't know whether it's average or median actually, but whatever it is, about half are below that poverty line for a family of four. And this is this is a job that's largely paid for with government money. Um, so uh, that goes back to the earlier part of the conversation is that the jobs that we had that built the middle class, I mean, this is a really big problem. Um, those industrial jobs that, that really, those people who worked really hard and they could send their kids to college. Um, that's, that's what's changed in a very significant way. Yeah, but you know, what, what surprised me in, in, in this in a way is that within uh, any one corporation, Mm -hmm. You have this kind of discrepancy. Mm -hmm. Surely the efficiency of the corporation, its output, and the way you measure it. Well, I think, you know, it's an, uh, hardly original of me to say, but <coughs> uh, corporations are very short sighted. You know, they're very interested in the bottom line every three months. So. Well, it has been interesting uh, to. We'll, we'll do one, oh, yes, one more yes, for yes. sure. The point I think that you made very uh, nicely. Uh, I attended recently a World Bank seminar and they pointed out that in many developing uh, countries, populated uh, countries such as Nigeria and mm -hmm. India, that the time official unemployment rate is very low because people uh, somehow get to, uh, to work at, uh, at uh, roadside stands mm -hmm. and sell matches or food or something. The fact that they earn two, three, four dollars a day. Uh, make no difference, it still qualify them as being employed. Yes. So the official unemployment rate uh, in, 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 in poor countries, in, in really poor countries, is, is really low, but that's a point that you were driving home. The quality of the income is just, uh, uh, that's, that's really what uh, the criteria here. It's very, it's very poor, you know. They're, they're yeah. doing something, they're doing something 
Well, if you know, people need. Yeah, people need to survive. So when, when we talk about this large number of people who, that we have who are uh, in this poverty so deep that you, you you know you can't live on it, right? Somebody who has an income of six thousand dollars only from food stamps, uh, they're in terrible straits. But they're not, and, and homelessness is up. But. Uh, People t are, not all people, but people tend to have some kind of a network and community that they're part of. And particularly when the economy is better, and, and I, I'm actually referring to research, although it's common sense, uh, the, the, when, when more people in that kind of neighborhood and network and, and extended family have work, you know, they kind of share it around, and the ones that aren't working uh, tend to, uh, we're talking mostly about women here, they, they tend to have a little job uh, cooking for other people. You know, keeps their dignity. Um, and and uh, taking in sewing of, of some kind, those, those kinds of things. Um, what's really terrible is when so many people lose jobs, and so there isn't, you know, th th there isn't as much to kind of share around, and that's where we've been for the last five years or so. So I was interested in uh, asking you, I guess as we come to the end of our mm. discussion, where are, where are the points of light? Where are the, where, what, what, what should we be looking forward to? What should we be optimistic about as we look to, I guess, closing these inequality gaps? Yeah. Well, I think that, uh, that uh, uh, we remember that the first President Bush talked about the points of life. <laughs> uh, but, y y the, you know, the policies are important and so on, but th that doesn't make you kind of light up. Oh, we've got 47 million people food uh, getting food stamps. Doesn't that make us, isn't that a point of light? That doesn't feel like a point of light, uh, even though it's very important. It's what I see as I go around the country. Uh, it, it, it's the things that are going on, and, and they tend to differ. I, I went uh, in uh, Des Moines uh, the other day to a center for working families uh, that had opened uh, in an African-American neighborhood uh, that was named for a woman named Evelyn Davis who died in her 90s, uh, who, you know, there isn't a lot, not, not a lot of color there in Des Moines. Uh, and she would call up the mayor, she'd call up the president of the bank, she'd call up the editor of the paper, and she'd say, you come out here. And so she was known, and they, everybody respected her, and, and so in her memory is this uh, building, it's got a supermarket in it, uh, but then the other part is this non nonprofit that's an outpost of the community college. Uh, but it's much, much more than that. So uh, they have job training uh, there. Uh, and it's, you know, it's up to the date, up to date. They've studied all the best uh, so-called sector-specific uh, job training. They have Youth Build, which is, uh, some of you may know Youth Build, it, 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 it's in many places in the country, but it, it's young people who've dropped out and they learn building skills. It's a kind of a double meaning thing. If you learn how to build things, it builds you. Uh, they have Gateways to College, which comes out of Portland, Oregon, where uh, you, you go and you can get a, it's got money that comes from the state to be a high school. It's part of the community college, but you don't use up your Pell Grants uh, in, in the getting, the, getting your high school diploma. So you get your high school diploma just like you were in high school, and then you can start community college and start using your Pell Grants then, which makes much, much more. And mm -hmm. this is all under one roof. Mm. Um, and I just, I was, I walked out of there beaming. <laughs> so it, that's, that's the kind of thing. And then one, one thing or another uh, like this, uh, every place I go, uh, people are doing, um, I spoke to the community action uh, directors uh, for the whole state in, in Missouri the other day. Now that's a mixed story. Some of them are not doing all that much, but some of them are doing really terrific things 
that, are, that make a difference for people's uh, lives. And, and the strongest things are, 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 are things where, where uh, people themselves are uh, very much involved in it and, and in running it and, you know, that it's very much part of the community. Uh, so that's, uh, and you know, as far as the schools are concerned, uh, there was a front page story in, in New York Times about Union City, New Jersey. And there's a book out by a man named David Kirp who, who lived there for two years looking at it. Working class, uh, nothing, you know, it's not some fancy experiment with a lot of, uh, you know, billionaires or anything like that. It's a regular public schools. Uh, and they've just had great leadership and, and they've, they've got strong principles into all the schools and they've done uh, the supporting of the teachers and helping the teachers to do a good job and they've got fabulous outcomes of these, you know, working class, low income people going to college. So that, that's, the, that's what keeps me going. That's great. It's great to hear that we can be the change we wish to see in the world. Yeah, it's terrific. Um, do we, are we good on time? Okay, well I want to thank Dr. Edelman, author of So Rich, So Poor, uh, and uh, just been terrific talking to you, sir. Thank oh, you so much for your thanks time. Thanks all of you for being so patient. Nice, thanks for coming. Thank you.